Welcome to the first episode of Series 54, everyone. You're in for a great series this month. We are covering the official RPG for the Lord of the Rings universe, The One Ring by Free League Publishing, with some of the folks from the Ethrabeth podcast. That's right, the new Rings of Power series started this month, and we think a lot of folks might want to give this game a try after being inspired by that show, so stay tuned. I'm really excited for this. Yeah. First of all, I I will say it out loud on this show. Steph and James, I love you. You're wonderful people. I'm so glad that I know you and so glad that you're in my life. Uh-huh. And also, this is a fun game. So It's so good. Um, yeah, and I'm excited for the show. So um, before we get into our show, though, um, please join us after our our episode for our call to action where we'll be talking about our thoughts on this game um, and the series as well as the final days of the Acaticon 2022 Kickstarter. So please enjoy the show, everyone, and we will catch you after the episode. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I am one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are thrilled to welcome Steph Midlock and James Pearson from the Athrobeth podcast to discuss The One Ring, a game that lets you play in the world of The Lord of the Rings. Welcome to Character Creation Cast. I'm really excited that you're both here. This yeah. is fun. I haven't gotten to talk to you guys in a long time. It's going to be good. Absolutely. Hey, thank you. We're so excited, too. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, Steph, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself, where people can find you online, what you're up to? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Steph Midlock, and I, along with my co-host, Jude Vase, uh, we run the Atherbeth podcast, simply called Atherbeth. Um, and it is a podcast that explores the lesser trod paths of Tolkien's J.R.R. Tolkien's Legendarium. And the Legendarium are like the the, the entirety of his works uh, all around the world of Middle Earth and, and Arda. Um, so we try to go into like some of the weirder texts, the essays, um, the books that are not the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. There's other things? A little bit beyond that. <laughs> <laughs> There's other things. <laughs> yeah. So that comes out monthly. Um, you can find that on the web at podcast.atherbeth.com. You can also find us um, on, you know, whatever uh, podcast thing you like to use, Spotify, whatever. And uh, we are on Twitter and Instagram at atherbeth underscore cast. I can be found at the North Four on Instagram if you're interested in that. And my co-host Jude can be found at Aromatic Jude. And the Bath Atherbeth podcast would not run without our amazing editor, who is also here today. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Hi, I'm James. Uh, yeah, so I edit the um, I edit the Atherbeth podcast. And I think probably more appropriate for this uh, show. I also uh, have GM'd the One Ring for Steph and Jude uh, for a couple of bonus episodes that they did. Uh, we did some spooky Halloween Hobbit episodes called Ooh. Halloween, um, <laughs> and so I uh, I GM'd using this game system we're going to discuss today. I also run a um, a home game for Steph, Jude, and a couple of our friends um, using the One Ring system, uh, which we do every other every other week. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you so much. Very cool. Oh, and I guess this is probably maybe, I don't know if this is, you know, interesting or anything, but I'm also Stephanie's husband. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's my sweet cheese. <laughs> Third in priority behind editing the podcast and GMing the game. I'm right. Also and then also her. in your spare time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever's left over after that. It, it's good yeah. to have hobbies. I will leave nothing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well, uh, let's go ahead and get into this, uh, and we will start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right. Uh, so what is the core concept of the One Ring? 
Well, yeah, I could I could jump in. I could jump in. So it's a tabletop role playing game based on the extended legendarium of J.R.R. Tolkien, but kind of focusing on the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Um, the goal is sort of for the players to feel what it's like to go adventuring in Middle Earth. This sort of I think the, the, the book says a wild and perilous land, which is, I think, so evocative and cool. Mm hmm. Yeah, and one cool thing that this game does, and it's stated right in the, the introductory chapter to this book, is they suggest that the play that the, the players think about the types of people who would have lived in this kind of ancient to like Dark Ages world, the, the world of Lord of the Rings, and create characters that perhaps have a more limited view of the world rather than something like D&D &D, where you're an adventurer and you're out there going, you know, dun you know, dungeon delving and stuff like that. Here, they specifically say you should consider making characters who maybe haven't ever been more than a few miles from their hometown or, mm. you know, know that there are other lands out there, but have never even thought about them until they get there. Similar to like Sam or, uh, you know, similar to Sam in Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. and I think that that's a really cool, um, cool suggestion because that is like a big part of what makes the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings so interesting is the dis the sense of discovery that the characters have, especially that the Hobbit characters have when they leave their bubble of safety and venture out into this wild world. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. It has a very beyond the wall sort of feel to it, which is nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I like that there's there's a suggestion right in the book to do that too, because I think people, especially people who have played lots of role playing games before, like that is not sort of your base instinct when you pick up a game is to like play somebody who doesn't know what they're doing you know um i think we're all used to kind of being like oh i know what i'm doing here and i'm competent and it's great <laughs> it'll all be fine <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly absolutely. yeah one of the questions we always ask um that it doesn't really apply as well here but we'll ask anyway um is what sort of setting do you play in in particular i'm kind of interested in because Tolkien's Legendarium has so much lore. Like, there's so much there. I want to know, maybe James, especially as a GM, how do you run a game in that? Like, how are you able to kind of, like, make it your own when there's already so much there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, Steph, of course, is the resident lore expert. But I think from a GM standpoint, you can kind of use as much or as little of the setting as you want. Like with the core rule book, they give you a really great um, image of what the world looks like. So basically the game as written in the core rule book is set, you know, roughly 20 years after The Hobbit. And so it's still about 30, 35 years before the start of Lord of the Rings. So you're in mm. this really interesting period in between the two sort of main um, like story points for the world. And it's set in the region of um, Eriador, which is basically where the Shire is. It was where the kingdom of Arnor, like if you hear, you know, from Lord of the Rings, Aragorn becomes the king of Gondor and Arnor. Arnor is this northern kingdom that was incredibly, uh, incredibly rich and incredibly prosperous, but then has fallen, you know, over a thousand years ago and is now largely empty and, um, you know, largely ruined and, and empty. And with the core rulebook as GM, they give you a good amount of detail about the region of Eriador and the people who are there and stuff like that. But of course, there is a huge wealth of extra setting details if you go out to back to the original source material or even to like the Tolkien Gateway Wiki, which has just a, you know encyclopedic amount of, of information about the area. So you can really use as much or as little of the setting as you are interested in because the, mm -hmm. you know, as written, you, you can already run a great game. One of the things that I think is really interesting about this setting, too, is because it's so desolate, even if you don't go really deep into the Tolkien lore, you could pretty much run a game that's very similar in feel to something like um, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, where you're in a beautiful but ruined and kind of desolate land. Um, or you could go super deep into, you know, into the history and stuff like that. Mm. I think that so, yeah, I mean, really, I think from a GM standpoint, you can get as you can use as much or as little as you want. And so it's not something that you need to feel like you need to be an expert in because yeah. everything you need is right there in the book. Very cool. Yeah, it's interesting, too. So many has I think everybody I, it's I've, I would challenge you to find someone that doesn't have some kind of preconceived frame of reference for this stuff. Right. Because right. we all told Tolkien is 
not only like, you know, the movies are so pervasive, but like it's the base of so much fantasy yeah. that we have today. It's the base of D&D, right? So there's are, there's going to be a lot of familiar things here, even if you're not, you know, especially even if you're not a Tolkien um, mm-hmm. person. Yeah, I feel like sometimes like if you're not into that, like you almost have more fun because you're like more chill about it. <laughs> like, <Yes. laughs> totally. like sometimes you're like, I don't care about the I'll just do what I want, you know. And then there's other times where you're like, actually, you couldn't do that though, because it's like, no, just settle down. Let right. it go. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, can, can you just like throw a village wherever you want and and uh you know not care that it uh goes against the the actual lore because oh by the way that spot you chose for that village that's actually this thing and lord here's like, the thing tolkien is not going to show up at your house <laughs> and tell you how to play this game jude yeah. might he might but i don't think mm. tolkien will you know and uh, you know we yeah so we play with jude who is yeah, as i said the co-host of after breath with me and you know the biggest tolkien scholar i know and like he doesn't really care either. I mean, I think like once you're in the world and you're sort of in mm. your own company and doing your own thing, I, I don't know. I, I think you can I think you can fill in where maybe things are missing um, yeah. from the main texts, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And even in the, the GM section of the book, they explicitly call out like Yes, this is a desolate region. It's mostly depopulated, but like there are, there can always be villages just off the beaten track because, you know, people have to live yeah. places. You know, not everything is, is recorded in the lore. Like mm. the, Tolkien is really big on sort of framing devices. So you have to remember, and I, I know I'm stealing a little bit of Steph's thunder here because she loves this aspect <laughs> of it, but you have to remember that the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings are stories written by people in the world. So they would not have written about things that were outside of the scope of their view. So there could have been mm. a village right over that hill but Bilbo or Frodo never went over there. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I, I never thought about that before. And it's even like hinted at in in, in the movies. Oh, hey, this uh, this is actually a story written from this Hobbit's perspective. And so therefore you've got a narrator that doesn't have omniscience, which is a really kind of an interesting way to approach those books and, and the lore of this whole world that was created. Mm-hmm. that's really cool yeah. yeah it makes you step back and go like oh is this a totally reliable narrator yeah. mm-hmm. who knows right yeah. it lets you fill in a lot of stuff which i think is really freeing well, I mean, because I, I, in ways where the fan sometimes the super fans like won't yeah. be you know those gatekeeper types um yeah i would say put that aside and just enjoy it for what it is it's especially a rich world ready to be populated especially written from the perspective of somebody that's been uh, like at least a little corrupted by the one ring <laughs> Oh, absolutely. It's fascinating. That's great. Yeah, it's pretty dope, yeah. right? <laughs> Tolkien's so cool. <laughs> I mean, generally, I feel like that's good advice for any RPG. Just, just like, let it go. Mm-hmm. Just do what you want. Just do what you go. feel. Seriously. Yeah, have fun. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't remember if James talked about this already, but I did want to mention, just when we're talking about setting, the time period that was chosen by the writers of this is very deliberate. It's it's an important time period because they make a big deal in the book that the shadow, like capital S shadow, is sort of returning to the mm. world. This is the twilight of the third age. Um, we're about like where they sort of date this. Um, I mean, it's not, not an exact date. You can use whatever you want. But there's we're sort of in this 80 year time period. We're about 50 years from when Frodo and company leave the Shire with mm. the ring. Right. So. Things are getting spooky and spoopy and and the stakes are getting higher all the time. And I think that's I, I like that they chose that specifically because I don't know, it, it leaves a lot of room for creepy stuff, Yeah, but not you don't have to stick to right mm-hmm. the, the canon. Right. And but you're not tripping over the more well-known parts of the story either. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Yeah. Well. Uh, what sort of tools then do we need to play this game? I saw there was something about some special dice. Yeah. James, do you want to tell them about the special dice? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So this game mainly, so they have special dice, but if you don't buy the set of special dice, you can just use regular dice. Basically you have two types. You have what they call feet die, which are, or a feet, feet dice, which are D12s. Um, but the 11 and the 12 are replaced with special symbols. The 11 mm. is replaced with the Eye of Sauron, and the 12 is replaced with the rune that Gandalf uh, uses for his name. Um, oh, interesting. Gandalf, yeah. And then you, so you have 
uh, feet dice, which are d12s, and you have success dice, which are d6s. Um, and again, they, you can use regular d6s. The ones that you buy from the set that they make are slightly different. Like um, the six has a little elven symbol on it to denote that you can use it for like great successes and stuff like that. But basically, mm. you know, you need two d12s and probably six or so d6s. Okay. Uh, yeah, but you don't, but again, like, yeah, you can use regular dice. It's totally fine. Um, cause, uh, Hey, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a millionaire. I don't want to buy everything, <laughs> but I mean, they are cute dice. They're really nice. So yeah, throw, throw them, uh, throw them a buy if you like them. There's also the core rule book, of course, which is beautiful. And I think like so well designed mm. and gorgeous. It just won any, I think for interior art. Yeah. Something like that. I don't remember if it was silver or gold, but, um, yeah, I can believe I, it. Yeah, I know we we put book. it up for it, and I think it won. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. It it feels like you're opening a tome that could be found in in like an archive of Minas Tirith. In a way, mm -hmm. it's like it's got um, it's just the artwork is absolutely gorgeous. It has some absolutely fantastic maps. If you're a map geek, mm -hmm. um, they took a lot of time. Um, and I know, uh, the writer, the the head writer and, um, the map maker spent a long time, um, researching all these things, especially in the Shire. Um, and, really making maps that like to a level of detail that maybe we haven't seen before mm -hmm. um which is really really cool uh yeah the art style is very like thematically appropriate too yeah. it's not like they just were like here's some D, &D art and we'll throw it in a book and like it's like <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it belongs in a tolkien book like, yeah absolutely there yeah. was a lot of care that went into it's it very evocative yeah mm -hmm. yeah it also starts, I love that it starts with the prologue and it ends with the appendix, which I guess kind of makes sense. But that also shadows Tolkien's own own books as well, yeah. which I think is sort of sweet. Just a nice little touch. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing, like, well, um, I think, uh, you know, we'll we'll see it again in the character sheet so we could talk about it again then. But the writer, the head writer is this guy named Francesco Nepotello, who is a big Tolkien fan. And he, if you read the 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 history, the, the extra material in the book, you sort of, he, he went out of his way to choose wording, to choose phrases, to choose, you know, sort of vocab words that Tolkien would have loved. Um, so you feel like it really does sort of put you in that mindset of like, and I was blah, 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 blah. Like <laughs> it's not, it's not um, inaccessible. It's just really fun mm -hmm. to read all that stuff. Like it's written very beautifully and in a manner that I think Tolkien would have, would have approved of. Um, so it's all part of that like world building moment. It starts like at the very first thing you open the book and you're presented with a, a letter from Gandalf and it mm. in this scribbly handwriting and it's like super I think that's super dope. I love yeah. it. Yeah, there are a lot of like tie-in properties that don't do as like loving of a job as this one does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you feel you when reading this book, you get the same feeling you get when you read The Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of crazy for yeah. a, an RPG rule book. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah, and it's huge too. It's not a small book. It's big, uh, mm -hmm. which is and nice. that can be a little scary maybe for new gamers. So I would also suggest that if you're newer to gaming or you maybe you don't want to get into the whole gigando thing, there's a really nice starter box you can purchase that has like um, a shortened version of the rules. It has um, a really nice like compendium all about the Shire, mm -hmm. um, and then it has. Uh, like five adventures in it and then um these pre-made characters which are really cool and they're sort of not characters that we see a ton of in Tolkien's writings but they are there so it's like Frodo's parents you could play as oh. or Pippin's dad oh, or cool. Mary's mom yeah it's that. really dope so and that's and so you get like the dice and you get some nice cards and some great maps and so the I think the starter box I really want to say is well done it's beautiful and it's a great way to kind of just get your feet wet absolutely what kind of stories and themes do you think that this game does best? Because um, I know, like, certain games have certain styles and you are meant to do certain things. Some are combat, some are, you know, exploration. So, like, what kind of things do you think that this game does well? Yeah, I think... Sure, I can... Oh, go ahead, James. Oh, no, yeah, you you go. Well, I mean, I think I think when we were... James and I were kind of thinking about this, I mean, what came to mind is... This game is, you know, all about adventure. That's really what it is. Um, it's deliberately structured to kind of emulate The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Mm. Um, you 
you've got a company, right? You and your your fellow hero players are are a company with a patron that's sending you out on quests, large or small, right? Um, the way that the adventure is structured, uh, the the emphasis on is on going there to the quest, but also coming back again. Um, which is, of course, that's part of that's part of Tolkien's whole thing there and back there and again. Back it really is about the whole journey, the small moments on the road, as well as like the big thematic, you know, fights and and moments that we know yeah. of, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that like, you know, it's you know that structure could be very similar. Like you could run, you could do that in a D and D game. Like that's essentially what you know D and D in certain circumstances is trying trying to do but here it's mechanically supported to play the game in that way and like have periods you know have you know adventuring periods and then have periods where you're you're in your safe haven where you're resting and you know uh, mm. doing that kind of thing like it's enforced by the rules to have that sort of style of of gameplay which is very cool oh that's nice it's a, it's a good thing to have that home base in a lot of games, especially like fantasy games, I think one of the shortcomings of D&D is you don't have a home base unless mm -hmm. you make it in yourself, right? Yeah, well, like true. you're supposed to have downtime, but like there's no mechanics for like yeah. what you're supposed to do. And but I it's... always get really frustrated when people are like, let me tell you about my D&D game and all of the yeah. stuff that we did. And I was like, all of that stuff you did is not part of the game. That's just a thing you made up. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's not what the game is for. <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting because like great point. D&D downtime is, oh, we're in a foreign city. Let's go and and shop and go to the taverns and and, and none of that's in the books right and <laughs> none of it's in the rules exactly but it's not like oh well we went out on this grand adventure and now we're coming back home and now we can you know have our local friends hang out have a feast you know mm -hmm. talk about our tales with the the various characters here and no, it's I did an adventure on to the next adventure. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a, that can Run get exhausting, down. right? So it's it's, yeah, it's refreshing that a game has that built in like this. Yeah. Absolutely. And there are there is there are sort of undertakings you can do during that downtime um that that invite players to reflect on what they just did. One of my favorite things is uh, for certain character types, you can write a song um, yeah, and different so cool. song, like whether it's a lay or a walking song or whatever, oh. that'll give you bonuses later on. Um, and so we in our own game have actually had a few songs written or poems written and we have really had a fun time with it. And it, and then they're just like this beautiful little thing that, reminds us of the first adventure we were on or whatever it is how sweet and nice and introspective is that yeah, i love that's it that's really, really very cool. tolkien i, like, I that. like that a lot yeah so it, I, we talked about this a bit characters go on adventures they come back they relax uh what uh, what do what can do characters do then specifically like could we as a group say hey you know i heard about this one rain thing maybe we should nip that <laughs> in the bud right away <laughs> <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah i mean i feel like that's the that's sort of the 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 primary question when you play licensed role-playing games that like mm -hmm. exist in a world that has established canon like how like you just need to establish right up front with your with your your table how comfortable do we feel it, like how much do we want to adhere to the canon and how comfortable do we feel making this an alternate universe where we go off the rails yep. like you know if you, I think that there is, there is a, absolutely a case to be made for either, uh, either sort of uh, game style. And it really depends on, on the preference for people at the table. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think in like, for instance, in the home game that we're doing, um, I've tried, I mean, not slavishly, but I've tried very hard to anchor it in a point in canon. Because for me personally, as, as a GM, and I know for some of our players, like that intersectionality between what we're doing in the game and real like established canon is interesting um and i think that that's one of the the big benefits you get from like a licensed rpg when your players run into somebody from the world who's like an established character it's kind of like it can be overdone but it's also kind of a thrill to like walk into a room and see you know gandalf sitting at a table or mm -hmm. something like that um you know but I think that there's also a case to be made for like, well, we want to be the big heroes in this world. Let's go take out this Sauron guy. So, I mean, really, it's up to it's up to your table. 
just uh, go after Saruman before he can screw things up and... <laughs> I mean, I've played exactly. like both kinds of games, like yeah. where you, you know, sort of rewrite the lore entirely so that your group is the one that saves the day. Mm. Yeah. Or, you know, you play like in Star Wars and you like make up your own planets and, you know, it has nothing to do with anything. It's just thematically like the same tones mm. and it has nothing to do yeah. with anything that happens in canon. And both of those can be really fun as long as your group is on board with that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Agreed. But I remember um, playing a bit of the Lord of the Rings online, uh, the MMO uh, that takes place, uh, and like getting snippets of actual lore on the adventure that you're going on. And then it's like, oh, that's cool that, uh, that I'm interacting with this thing that tangentially, you know, down the line in the story means this. A and now you've got this like, feeling of like hey now we're part of the background of that story like like uh what was it uh like the star wars stuff that's coming out nowadays like oh you're on uh you're the main characters were off doing x and we're the side characters in the cantina mm -hmm. on the other side of the planet and we think we're the main characters right yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. I or, always think I'm the main character. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you kind of get into that, you know, it could potentially be a problem, but you kind of get into that prequel mindset where, you know, you can like for, using Star Wars as a good example. It's like, OK, well, we can do sort of we could have this game be Rogue One where we go and steal the plans and hand them off to the main characters or we're the Bothans who steal the, the Death Star plans. You know, mm -hmm. that's also an interesting way to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I do like, you know, with um, Tolkien gave us so many um, cool locations that, that our main characters from like the Lord of the Rings or Bilbo or whatever, they just stop in really quickly and then move on. And but this game lets you like go back like, I don't know, the like Weathertop, right, where where Frodo gets stabbed with the Nazgul blade. Like you guys could go camp there. And there's something really neat about that to know, like 50 years in the future, a little kid is going to get mega stabbed here. I don't know, I just think it's neat. <laughs> There's something like I was here. There's like a thing like my character was here. Mm -hmm. yeah. and even though they're not remembered in the main text, I know they were here. There's a song that exists somewhere. That We carved our initials in that in. tree. It's fine. Yep. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> What's up, Frodo? <laughs> Don't get stabbed, man. What does that mean? <laughs> Um, we've talked a little bit about it, but I'm interested to know kind of from your perspective, what do you think makes this game unique, both from other sort of um, like media property tie ins and then also from other adventuring games? Well, uh, I think, okay. you know, obviously, ahead, <laughs> obviously the first the like probably the biggest thing that makes this unique is this is the actual officially licensed J.R.R. Tolkien RPG. Like mm -hmm. the, you know, the owners mm -hmm. of the media license, this is the one that they've denoted is the actual official, you know, RPG, which, you know, obviously you can go and you can make a Tolkien game. In, like there's so many resources out there. You could go and run a game in Middle Earth using D&D &D or, you know, a Dungeon World, any system you want. But like this is the one that has the, you know, has the official blessing, you know, of of the property, mm -hmm. um, you know, for better or worse. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we've talked about this a lot, but you, as you say, like you, you, you can go as close as you want to the source material. And there's a lot of stuff in these books that you can fall back on to help you with that if you want to. Um, I think, I think this is kind of neat that you can open up, you know, if you have read, if you like Tolkien, you like The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, like you can open up this core book. And if you really get into it, like you can learn some really cool stuff about the world. There's like timelines in there, man. Mm -hmm. And there's like there's some like if this is a very well researched book that yeah. that supports the canon. Mm -hmm. But again, as James has said, you know, you don't have to stick to it, but it's there if you want. So like you can get a little bit of a Tolkien lesson from yeah. this, which I think is pretty dope. Like that's neat. Um, if if you want it, and at the same time, totally ignore it if you don't want it. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't want to friggin' learn. Come on, man. But uh, <laughs> I'm trying to have fun well, here. I don't want to read books. Yeah, hello. <laughs> I mean, and I guess 
<laughs> I guess that's where this being the official game comes in handy. Like, you know, you could unofficially go out there and find all of the, the resources you want to run an amazing Tolkien game in any system, but you have to do all that research yourself. You've got to go mm -hmm. and read the yep. source material. You've got to go to Tolkien Gateway and read all the wiki articles and stuff like that. Here, you go to the GM or the About the World chapter and it's bullet pointed, broken down. Here's what you'll find in this part. Here are the monsters you'll deal with. Like it's, you know, this is the, this is the easy way to run a Tolkien yeah. game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is great because that's so much more inviting. As we've said, yeah. you know, Tolkien in the past has been so gatekeepery, not him himself, but the fans right over the years. It's been mm -hmm. so sucky um, mm -hmm. for, for some folks to kind of enjoy it. And that sucks. We're not doing that anymore. This is for everybody. And so this book is really a great uh, resource. And I think, um, you know, for the source material, if you want it. Yeah, I mean, I think it it certainly, especially like it's. I mean, it's a big book, but like I, I think it still makes it more approachable than you know, like trying to do all of that research yourself and like dig yeah. through and find what you're looking for. And like, there's so much out there. Like, there's so much to know, and so it is mm -hmm. kind of nice to just like have a book be like, okay, but here's all you need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like exactly. we've picked out the important <laughs> parts for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's there's people that have their doctorate in Tolkien right. and stuff, yeah. and like, there's so much out there that you can have a doctorate in right. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> right. You can write your own dissertation <laughs> if you want. Yeah, yeah. Or if you're Steph and Jude, you can do fifty episodes about mm -hmm. it. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, 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 right, and, and not and have, have scratched these... the surface. Exactly. exactly. Right. <laughs> I still think that you both need to come here and go to Marquette and like look at the archives and everything. Like, yeah, I would literally die. That would be the greatest. Thing come in the visit world. me. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna work on that. We're Do doing it. it. Do it. I'm a vampire. I've been invited in. I'm coming. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of history, uh, the history of this game uh, was kind of interesting when I looked into it. Um, apparently, the first. This is the second edition of the game. Mm -hmm. The first edition was released in 2011 by Cubicle 7. And then they had plans of doing a second edition, but never did. And then in 2019, they lost the rights because they never followed up on it. And then Free League Publishing, uh, which made this game, uh, the second edition, acquired the rights in 2020. And then kickstarted it March 2021 successfully and... And here we are uh, mm -hmm. with this gorgeous. Uh, yes, tome. this book that we keep holding up in this audio medium so that I everyone know. can see it. <laughs> look at the look at the book. It's so <laughs> nice. Well, it's, it's interesting because like the like the book itself is like it it feels different than other RPG books. Like the mm -hmm. the cover oh, yeah. itself even has a different it's like texture. Textured and yeah, yeah, it's it really interesting. The pages are not glossy. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it, it feels like an old book that you would find in like a, like an ancient library or something, right? But like, yeah. goodness gracious, it's it's just gorgeous through and through. Uh, Free League did a really there, great job. There is also it. a um, there's like a fan. I'm holding up kind of in front of my green screen, but there's um a fancy version too that's made to look like the wed the Red Book of Westmart. Oh, so it's oh. like leatherette and gold oh, and i mean fancy. it's the same book but just has a different oh, cover that's wild. um so i'm like oh, okay they went hard on this one <laughs> <laughs> stupid free league only sent me the regular version yeah <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because i i didn't really hear about it uh when it first kickstarted and it was kickstarted in four like in four minutes it funded Dang! Yeah. Really? They hit the launch button, amazing. and four minutes later, done. Done. Like <laughs> that's actually doesn't gracious. Me. No, it doesn't surprise me at all. But no. my goodness, yeah, it's, it was a really interesting history of the of how this game came to be, and um, it, it sounds like Free League did a really fantastic job with it. Yeah, I kept hearing like from people that it was like really, really good, and then it yeah. like because it was in any submission, it showed up at my door, and I was like, "Oh, sweet, I don't have to buy it." Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something that's kind of interesting. So the writer is the same for both the first edition and the second edition, Francesco Nepotello. Oh, interesting. And what's neat about the first edition? The first edition is set in a different area of middle earth right so what we said earlier on that this the second edition is set uh in area door which is mm -hmm. on one side of the misty mountains right between the misty mountains and the sea the old version is set on in rovanian which is if you go over to the east 
over the Misty Mountains and you're in Mirkwood, right, where the Hobbit takes place, mm. you're where the Lonely Mountain is. It's a different ge- geographical area. And it's also set about 20 years in the past from this current story. Oh. And so and this was very intentional so that players who had beloved characters from the first game, from the first edition, can keep playing their characters in the second edition. Oh, amazing. It doesn't... It doesn't like negate the first edition at all. The first edition is merely the past of the second edition. And what's really cool about this is they put out so much supplemental material for the first edition, including new lands, new people you can be. Uh, my favorite uh, group in the Middle Earth, if you know me from Aftermath, is Rohan because I like all horses. <laughs> there's a whole, there's like two Rohan books that they put out. So what's really nice is if you want to, um, brew up as a second edition character you can use first edition stuff and kind of squish it into the second edition and it works really really well and i like that the first edition is still a valid thing that you can play if you if you want to it just makes the world even bigger which i think is kind of dope yeah that's really nice when they don't cancel each other out and you can still you know because i know people always get mad about new additions too and it's like nobody's coming to your house and taking your old stuff it's fine (laughs) but people always still get like really weird and wigged out i'm like nobody's gonna show up and like take your books they're Uh yours forever yeah um yeah <laughs> but it's nice that at least it's it's a little more compatible because sometimes they're really not mm-hmm. um, especially when they like restart timelines or you know whatever oh yeah were the yeah. were yeah. the mechanics exactly. fairly different in first edition then or fairly similar I think they're pretty similar. They're just sort of, right. everything's kind of updated, oh, right, interesting. James? Yeah, that's right. They still use the sort of the, the same, you know, like D12 plus D6 dice system. I think that there were some some rules that were a little crunchier. One of the things that Francesco said specifically was that this was an opportunity for them to take, you know, 10 years of feedback on version one and streamline version two using that feedback. I think also, interestingly, orthogonal to you know, to um, the this the One Ring RPG, um, Cubicle 7 also released Adventures in Middle-Earth, which was the One Ring, like it, which was the Lord of the Rings setting, but using the D20 system. Mm-hmm. And from what I've heard, uh, Free League is going to be releasing the same thing using D20 for, uh, for Lord of the Rings soon. Like, I think it's in the pipeline to come out next year. Oh, like cool. That. Very nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so keep your eyes on that. All right. So one last thing before we get into our actual character creation, um, which is terms and concepts. Are there things that are going to come up as we do character creation that people need to know to be able to follow along? Yeah, there there are. We wanted to we didn't mention this earlier, but I did just kind of want to call out even before just for, from the wider game, because it's so important to the structure of this game, that this game has two alternating phases. We kind of touched on it, but I just want to call out their names. So there's the adventuring phase and the fellowship phase, and they go one after another forever and ever as as long as you want to play. The adventuring phase is your traditional adventure uh, that you all go, that we all know. It's you. I mean, the book suggests it's like two to three sessions, but of course you can do whatever you want. Then you have a fellowship phase that comes after the adventuring phase, and that is that downtime, Mm -hmm. right? Where you sort of narrate what you do when you come back from your adventure and you rest and you do certain stuff, and it kind of wraps up the adventure um the adventuring phase is then when you're on the adventure there are like combat engagements there's council engagements which are like social engagements Mm -hmm. um if you're like l5r i know amelia you do um it's like trying to get stuff via social interactions Mm -hmm. um which is neat and then there's uh the uh, something called the journey uh which is like anytime you travel from one location to another on the map you go through this journey phase um and this this sort of allows you to generate things that happen to your characters along the road and there's different roles that the characters get um so that everybody in your party sort of has a task whether it's the scout figuring out where you're going or the hunter finding your food and then you roll to see like what weird like what weird thing you come across or like Hmm. does it go well or badly Mm -hmm. And that really helps flesh out because, as we know, like it's not just about the destination; it's about the journey. Um, so yeah, well, I if it's Tolkien, to it's like ninety nine percent about the journey. <laughs> right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of walking happening in those books. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so much walking. There's so much geez. walking. <laughs> but the, and James, like, did the you want to talk phase, about? Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say the journey phase is like my absolute favorite part of of the game. Like, you know, the mm-hmm. the fact that they have sort of like this mechanically supported like you know, 
that, that it's mechanically supported, that you're you know going to experience this journey. Because like you said, that is so much of what Tolkien's stories are about going, you know, it's not, you know, it's going to the place and the things that happen along the way. Um, and because the mechanics of the journey phase rely basically on just a lot of roles to determine what's going to ha- like what's going on, um, you get a lot of unexpected stuff happening during these yeah. during these phases, you know, and that is super that is mm-hmm. super fun and super interesting. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. As far as like other basic terms to know, you're going to see on your character sheet, you have attributes of strength, heart and wits, um, which are sort of your physical profile, your emotional profile and your mental profile of your character. Um, There are I would say it would it's nice to kind of talk or to kind of keep in mind something called hope, which it's your reserves of so your spiritual vigor, right? It's it's a way it's things you can draw on when you're in danger. Mm. Um, there's also a, a big part of this is your shadow, which are basically like the bad, the the negative things that happen as the the shadow. So we talk about the shadow with the capital S. The shadow is like this, like bat, you know, the evil that's creeping back into the world. Um, and so it's not just like just the ring itself, right? But it's all the things that are coming back uh, mm-hmm. that will that will kind of negatively affect your character, whether it's greed or you know what I mean, as like mm-hmm. those kind of highbrow things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I love the shadow stuff. We haven't actually done a ton with it, so our characters are pretty shiny, but hope and shadow is really cool. <laughs> right, yeah, absolutely. I like that. Interesting. Well, it, it sounds like we might have enough to to start creating characters. Do we do we wanna do we wanna make some people? Let's make yeah. some people. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah, let's make some people. Let's make some people. All right. So what's the first what is step one? Yeah. How do we how do we people? How how make people? So, <laughs> so the first step to make people is to pick your heroic culture. Um, the heroic cultures, like the starting cultures in this game, basically represent the free peoples most likely to be found in Eriador. If I recall correctly, there are, well, so there are several heroic cultures. There are, yeah. how many are there? There's four, but then within the four, there's... Sub- so there's like you can play as you can play as dwarves, you can play as elves, you could play as uh, men, which, you know, the capital M men meaning humans. humans. Come on. And uh, you can play as hobbits, mm-hmm. which is kind of dope. Come on. Everyone wants to play a <laughs> hobbit. Um, and then within like the men category, there's like different men, yeah, yeah. They've men got groups. What Bardings, men of Bree and Rangers of the North I see listed. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Perfect. So exactly. Going through sort of the heroic cultures that they that they have. So the Bardings are men, humans from the north. They they hail from what's called Wilderland, which is the area around the Lonely Mountain. Um, if you remember from the Hobbit, at the end of the Hobbit, um, uh, Bard the Bowman kills Smaug and he becomes king of uh, Dale. Mm. Um, the people from Dale or the people from that area become the bardings the people of bard um they are um they're hardy folk they're merchants uh they are they don't live in eriador so if you're playing a barding you're most likely somebody who has traveled uh across the mountains for some purpose either uh you know to bring goods from the lonely mountain or from dale or you know you're exploring something like that but you're not from eriador so that's something to consider if you were to pick a barding Mm-hmm. The okay. next culture are the dwarves of Durin's folk. So these are essentially the dwarves that we see in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Um, they hail from uh, they hail from a number of different areas. They could be from uh, under the Lonely Mountain, where um, you know that's the the where um, Thorin and his company went. Uh, and then after Thorin died, the Lonely Mountain is ruled by uh, Thra- uh, uh Dane, King Dane Ironfoot, right? Um, yeah, I think so. I don't know. That sounds right. Doesn't matter, whatever. Yeah. But the dwarves could also be so Who cares. The dwarves could also be from underneath the Blue Mountains or even the mountains in Linden. There are sort of a number of areas, like basically anywhere where there are mountains, you can kind of put dwarves there. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. And the dwarves, you know, obviously, like from what we see in The Hobbit and what we see in The Lord of the Rings, they're, you know, they're short, they're hardy. Um, you know, they're dwarves. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. The next culture are the elves of Linden. So Linden, if you look at the map of Eriador, Linden is the uh, is like the area most to the west. Like when the elves leave Middle Earth, they go to the Grey Havens. The Grey Havens is one of three like elf cities in mm. Linden. Um, at the very end of the Lord of the Rings movie, you know, they go, they get on the boat. That that harbor where they're at, that's the Grey Haven. So that's in Linden. Um, mm. The elves of Linden are a distinct. He, like they're basically a distinct group of elves separate from the elves of Rivendell and the elves of Mirkwood and Lothlorien. Um, and they're, you know, ruled, quote unquote, by Círdan the shipwright. And Círdan is a is like a high elf who's um, basically his mission is to like build the ships that take the elves back across the sea to the west. And, you know, one of the like more touching things is that he's one of the last elves that remains in Middle Earth and he leaves on the last ship. Um, when all of the other elves have gone. So as an elf of Linden, you know, you are, you are tied into that culture um, that is facilitating the elves leaving um, Middle Earth, which is a little bit different than if you were to play an elf of Rivendell or an elf of Lothlorien. Um, and so that's an interesting aspect of the elves. Elves, of course, in this setting are the traditional Tolkienian elves. They're immortal. Um, and, you know, even, uh, even when they die, they don't leave the world they return to you know the, they were they stay in the world and they return to the to the west essentially the next culture are the hobbits of the shire um obviously this is you know bilbo frodo pippin uh uh mary all sam all of the uh, all of the hobbits that we see in the movies uh and the books um hail from the shire the shire is a beautiful like a beautiful verdant land in the middle of eriador um and the hobbits are you know, typically thought of as like a very sort of, you know, insular folk who are more concerned with eating and having a good time um, in their own land than the things that are happening in the outside world. Of course, you know, because of this, if you play a Hobbit of the Shire, you should consider, you know, why you would have left your comfortable Shire. If this is a game that ventures outside of the Shire, you could definitely do a game where you just all play Hobbits and run around in the Shire, like helping Farmer Maggot you know, get the people who are stealing his crops. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're going to venture out into the wider world, you need to think that, like, it was a bit of a scandal that Bilbo left with the dwarves in The Hobbit. And he had a reputation when he mm-hmm. came back. You know, and they always said, oh, he had a little bit of that, of took blood in him, which is what made him sort of weird. And he, you know, that was why he left the, the, um, the Shire. Mm-hmm. But so if you make a Hobbit character and it's a game where you're going to leave the Shire, you should think about, like, why you would have left your comfortable home. Did mm-hmm. you, you know, are you drawn to adventure? Do you get pulled into adventure against your will and you're trying to get home? Like, these are some interesting things with a, a, a Hobbit character. Mm-hmm. The next culture is the men of Bree. So Bree is the, is the town that is closest to the Shire. That it's a, it's a mannish town close, closest to the Shire. If you remember in Lord of the Rings, when Frodo, Sam, Pippin, and Mary leave uh, at the beginning of their journey, they're their first destination is Bree, um, where they're mm-hmm. trying to meet up with Gandalf and then uh, and go from there. Um, it's right on the border of the Shire uh, through the old forest. Um, and it's a town that's a little bit, I mean, there's not really a cosmopolitan town in, uh, in Eriador, but if you look at it, it's sort of at the intersection. If you look at it on the, on the map, it's at the intersection of a road that runs north-south and a road that runs east-west. So Bree sees hobbits from the Shire. It sees dwarves traveling down from the mountains. Um, and it occasionally even sees elves, although I don't think elves really stay in the city that much. But it's, it's a town of men that is exposed to the wider world. So the men of Bree are a little bit more... Um, they, they understand the world a little bit more than perhaps some, some men from other, from other mm. areas. And then the last culture are the Rangers of the North. So these are uh, the these are the Dúnedain. Um, Aragorn in uh, in the Lord of the Rings is a Ranger of the North, and basically these are the descendants of the people of the Kingdom of Arnor, who now wander the wilds and oppose the Shadow as the Shadow is growing in Eriador. Oh, interesting. So the first that was a good rundown. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. thank you. Thanks. Um, 
So obviously the first step is to pick a heroic culture. Um, and this will set a number of things. It'll give you some, like it'll give you basically some attribute blocks. It'll give you some skill blocks, some different like cultural, th uh, you know, cultural things. But basically it's the, the first building block of your character. Okay. So as the first step selecting our culture, does anyone have ideas what they want to do? Because I got mine figured out. Oh, what's yours? Uh, yeah, what are you gonna I was do? Gonna, I was gonna be an elf of Linden. Ooh, oh, very that's cool. so perfect. Yeah. Yes, you have to. I <laughs> nice. <laughs> and Amelia, what do you think you wanna do? Oh, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> They're all so good, you yeah. know? They're great. I feel like Steph's gonna be a hobbit. I I will choose last because I don't mind. I can play all the things. I love all the things. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in our homebrew game, we had someone who wanted to play a human from Gondor. And so we sort of like went back to first edition and found a Gondor person and kind of right because they're from the other side of the Misty Mountain. So they're not in this edition. Mm -hmm. We also have I my characters from Rohan. So of course, we had to again use first. <laughs> of course, you know, I always play unicorn in L5R, you know, come I on, do. I'm a I horse do. boy. <laughs> I do. I specifically so, remember uh, your mm -hmm. furry underwear in that game that I ran. Because <laughs> apparently that's what unicorns wear. <laughs> that's, they, they need it. You got to keep warm. Amazing. Everywhere, you know? It's good padding. Uh, I think I am going to go <laughs> with uh, Men of Brie. Oh, interesting. Nice. Okay. That seems fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. That does seem fun. Then I'm going to build a Hobbit of the Shire. Okay. And I will make a dwarf. Because we got it. All right, nice. Nice. We got a good we have cultures. a good fellowship going on here. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Yay. Okay, so I'm gonna write Hobbit of the Shire. Yeah. So now that we've sheet. we've picked our, our cultures, you can then also record record your cultural blessing. So if you go in the book to the the culture, like each section for the culture, right underneath characteristics, there's a cultural blessing. And this is something that is uh, like a special a specialty that you get from being part of that culture. Okay, okay, so for mine, it's called Hobbit Sense. I have learned my place in the world, and uh, I have a, rusk, a robust capacity for insight uh, that apparently people mistake for a lack of courage. Okay, so whatever. <laughs> um, so for wisdom rolls, oh, my wisdom rolls are favored, and I gain uh, one die on all shadow test made to resist the effects of greed okay Ooh, okay nice. okay mm -hmm. nice yeah i like it i, I really yeah. like these uh the cultural blessing of the elves of linden uh is by virtue of their birthright elves are capable of reaching levels of finesse unattainable by mortals and uh the, mechanically that means if you are not capital m miserable uh, you can spend one point of hope to achieve a magical success on a skill roll. That is super cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. 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 You know, like a capital M miserable. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah, my character is miserable here, but they don't have the miserable condition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, and so the magic thing is something to talk about, too, with Tolkien, like, you know, in D&D, &D you get this high magic, like spells slinging around vicious mockery and whatnot. Uh, but in, you know, in Tolkien's world, it's sort of uh, more natural, like low magic, just like natural stuff. It's not spells. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's more like, you know, a tuning with the with nature or whatever it is. Right. Does that seem right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like the, the wizards oh, that you see in the actual source material, aren't they like literally deities or something like that? Yes. Yeah, they are. Yep. They're like an, they're like almost like angels. Yeah, yeah. They're like helper angels for like the demigods of the world. Yeah, yeah so, they're called so they've got these <laughs> like extra like powers that, you know, mere mortals uh, or or mere elf immortals. Uh, don't yeah. exactly have access to, which is really fascinating. Totally. Yep. I love that. So once you've picked, so now that we've gotten our uh, culture and, and cultural blessing recorded, the next step is to pick your attributes. Um, each culture has uh, a set of, like has a set of attributes that you can choose from. Um, there should be a little table. You can either 
pick a set or you can roll a success die and get whatever set you roll. Um, but basically you have three main attributes, which are strength, which is you know physical strength, heart, which is like emotional uh, capacity, and wits, which is uh, intelligence, you know, intelligence or, or like mental capacity. Okay, so there's like six sets here. So we could either pick or we can randomly roll. Right. Ryan is oh, randomly rolling. We get to roll stuff? Yeah. I might have to roll stuff. I might have to roll stuff. I, I We always do if it's a choice. Yeah, we, it's 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 kind of our unwritten rule for ourselves. Feel free to do what you would like uh, for your own characters. But um, I, I love I love rolling things. Uh, so how do I roll for my stuff? So if you look at the table uh, in your culture, um, the first column is roll, and then it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So you just roll 1d6, and whatever number comes up, you pick. You then get the strength, heart, and wits from that corresponding row. Oh, fascinating. So like, so my strength goes 5, 4, 5, 4, 5, 6. Um, so I, it, oh, that's weird. Okay, I like it, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Ooh. I'll do that too. Wait, what do I roll this? A D6. Yeah, roll a D6. I have One like this successful. jar full of dice, but I have some elvish dice in here and I can't find the D6. <laughs> oh no, it's really going to bother me. So, oh, here's one. Found one. I can't find my, my dice rolling surface, so I'm going to have to... Oh, I found it. There to we go. roll it on a table like a loser. Like a, like a heathen. <laughs> <laughs> podcast heathen I'm my my rolling tray is out in the other room all right and we put this in rating right james yeah this goes in rating Del, Two, i rolled a four so i've got pink. four six four four strength six heart four wits. well you roll for each for right uh no you roll and then just take the set of, of oh you get the uh, whole attributes. set yeah <gasps> oh fun because i rolled a five and that gave me five four five Five strength, nice. four heart, five wits. Oh, that's the least Ooh. wits I could get. Aw. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're going to play. But I've got the most heart that I could get. So that makes a lot of oh. sense. Yeah. And the second highest strength. Oh, that's really, okay, I get it. So it goes across. Like, my, if I rolled a one, it would have been five, two, seven. Uh, and a six is six, two, six. So it's like, that's really cool. I got three, yeah. four, seven. Ooh, oh, not very smart. strong, but I'm smart. Yeah, He's smart cookie. I got that's good. That's, seven... that's an Amelia character right there. Is what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I got seven strength, three heart, and four wits. So uh, it's just a big strong dummy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's very good. I like that. All right. So if we've all got our attributes set. So the next thing that you do is you calculate your strength, heart, and wits target numbers. So basically, whenever you roll for a skill or a combat proficiency in this game, the way that you do that roll is you roll one uh, feet die, which is the d12, plus a number of d6s or success die equal to your rating in that skill or combat proficiency. Um, and what you want to get with your roll is equal to or better than your target number for that corresponding attribute. So you course you calculate your target number by taking your attribute uh, by taking 20 and subtracting your attribute from it. So for instance for me for if to calculate my strength target number I take 20 and I minus 7 my my strength attribute and I get 13. So my 13 my strength target number is 13. And when I roll I want the sum of my dice roll to be equal to or greater than 13. Oh, okay. so we put the oh, I see. We 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 use the little radio dials for our actual attribute, and we put the target number in the little boxes. Exactly. Yes. Ha ha. Wait, so we minus the rating from twenty, James? Yeah, twenty minus your rating. One of the things they say in the book that 20 minus your rating is what you should use for a longer campaign. If you want to do a one shot or like a really short story, uh, it would be eighteen minus your. Um, your rating because then you're like you are a little bit more likely to succeed this is based on having some time to grow your character okay that's cool uh and then once you've calculated your target numbers the next thing to do would be get your derived stats of endurance hope and parry um those are calculated so endurance is basically your like endurance is your stamina it also counts as your hit points um 
Hope is your supply of like spiritual resolve. They also act as luck points. Uh, you know, essentially you can spend them like luck points. And then parry is how hard it is to hit you. And that basically applies a difficulty to enemies' attacks against you. Mm. Um, let me find the formulas for that. Oh, if you look in your culture, right below the table of your attributes, there should be a derived stat section and it should be your rating plus some number. So for instance, for me as a dwarf, my endurance is my strength plus 22. Um, so just, you know, so you can use the, the table from your culture for this. That's interesting. Each culture is different. Mm -hmm. that. That's cool. So I'm sporting a 25 endurance, 12 hope, and 17 parry. Whoa. Oh, nice. I'm at 23, 14, and 17. Nice. I'm at 22 endurance, 16 hope, and 16 parry. <laughs> All right. I was calculating them based on my target number, not on my rating. So that's why I was like, oh, man, 35 <laughs> endurance? I'm a beast. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I have 29 endurance, 11 hope, and 14 parry. Still not too bad. Nice. All right. So now that we've done that, the next section is skills. So if you continue down the page in your culture, um, basically each culture gets sort of a basic set of skills. Um, like you'll see there's a table that just basically tells you how many points you have in each uh, skill based on your culture. Um, so you just fill those in uh, exactly what's on the, the table for your culture and then choose um, one skill among the two that are underlined and mark it as favored. And essentially favored skills allow, like when you have something that is favored, you roll two feet die and you pick the better. It's like having uh, advantage mm. in uh, D20. Okay. Interesting. So I have to choose between Sawn and Lore for my two favored. Um, James, what is Song? Can you tell us what that, yeah. what that actually does? Song is literally your ability to sing or craft songs. Um, I think it comes in handy, like, you know, you can use Song in culture, like in um, council meetings like when you have a council scene which is like basically like a social engagement you can use songs to um like tell the story that you've you've been through and get some bonus points i think that also might be able to be used to like bolster your um your team stuff like that nice okay that's that's helpful yeah, i like that um tolkien tolkien's uh writings are peppered with songs uh which i will admit to all of you here as i have done on athrobat that as an early reader of tolkien's work i would often skip the songs because they go on for freaking pages and pages <laughs> and you know what that's that's fair totally skip them if you don't like them but as a later reader um i found that they are beautiful and um full of emotion and uh really well done and so um yeah i like that song is like an actual <laughs> skill in here <laughs> well if i can say too like um i'm a big audiobook fan and one of the things that i think is like a huge advantage of the audiobooks is the performance of the songs by the narrators um i think mm -hmm. there are two like there are two big major audiobook versions of the lord of the rings out there and one of them is by andy circus and the other one i forget uh, I think Rob Inglis is the narrator. Rob Inglis basically sings all of the songs and they mm. are incredible. And Andy Serkis, of course, is an amazing performer. He doesn't sing them quite as much. I think he actually does sing them. I don't think his are as good. Um, but mm -hmm. in both cases, they like you don't skip the songs because they're actually being performed to you. It's amazing. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it changes them a lot. Nice. Well, so I'm, I'm one of the things of my... My cultural hero or whatever it is, is stealth because I'm very small. I'm a small boy, S-M-O-L, uh, <laughs> as a hobbit. So I, and that's one of the ones I can choose. I would choose between courtesy and stealth. And I'm going to choose stealth as my favorite stat because I want to I want to be able to get in places. Oh, man. <laughs> Trixie hobbits is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mine's between insight and riddle. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. What's Riddle? What does Riddle do, James? Riddle is literally your ability to solve, uh, like to solve riddles. Oh, boy. I mean, and we know. Reasoning and intuition, yeah. So here's the yeah. thing. Can my character solve riddles or do I have to solve riddles? Because. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why there's a dice roll. That way you don't have to do it yourself. Yeah, this is okay, the cheat great. code So version. we're going to go ahead and pick yeah. Riddle. <laughs> <laughs> this is the game that genie of skills. Yeah. <laughs> You put a, you put a mean, puzzle in our game? Mm, I'm going to just roll on Riddle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we know, too, from The Hobbit, Riddles are a big deal. You know, mm -hmm. another big yeah. Tolkien thing. 
Yeah. I do like riddles, mm-hmm. actually. They're fun. What's in my pocket? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a dwarf, I got to choose between craft, which makes a lot of sense, and travel. I actually picked travel because travel is really interesting. That's essentially you use that skill during the journey phase to um, like to basically like plot the course that you're doing and see how far you can get before things happen, mm. um, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go with song then. Because every group Ooh. needs a, a person that can sing well. And you always <laughs> pick some kind of perform or something whenever that's a choice. That's what you always go with. <laughs> yeah. Heck yeah. Gotta, gotta keep up uh, morale. All right. Absolutely. All right. So after All right, nice. putting your skills in, the next thing is to add your combat proficiencies. And basically, this is your like combat skill. You would use these like this gives gives you the number of success die you roll when making an attack an attack with that particular weapon. Uh, there should be right underneath the skills. There should be another table showing the proficiencies that you uh, you should get. Like for instance, for a dwarf, I can choose axes or swords, and I get two points in that, and then one combat proficiency of any type that I'd like to choose. Nice. I see on the character sheet, it's axes, bows, spears, and swords. Are they, those the only ones that we can choose from? Essentially, yes. Um, okay. There, there are rules for making attacks with like unarmed combat or um, like daggers and stuff like that. Essentially, in the case where you're making an attack with something that you don't have listed on this list here, you take a small penalty, but you can just make, you basically like roll one die less than your maximum uh, combat proficiency. Okay. Okay, so you can always still try. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, Do I want axes or spears? Both. <laughs> well, it says or. <laughs> no! Right, no! I mean, technically I could. I could choose the other one at one. Yeah. I've got I've got to choose between bows and spears, and I just chose bow because I'm an elf. Because that makes sense. Like, makes why sense. would you pick something yep. else? <laughs> yep. Don't be ridiculous. I know. That's perfect. Um, Apparently, hobbits could be, choose bows or swords, which is dope. So I'm going to choose swords because nice. <laughs> I love the idea of, like, a tiny little hobbit sword. So cute. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I'm going to go with the spears, and then I will I will put the other one. I'll put axes at one. I'll put spears at two. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I went with bows at two and swords at one. Nice. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. very classic. Yeah, and of course, as a dwarf, I had to pick axes as my as my max. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then and then I put one in spears because the idea of a dwarf with like a tiny dwarf with a huge spear is just so funny to me. So I oh, love amazing. that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. Does that include throwing yeah. spears as well? Hmm. I, I don't know. So. I assume. I don't it know, just I have says to check that. spears, so I assume it's anything <laughs> yeah. you want to do make, with a spear. Loves the hero to make ranged yeah. and close combat attacks with a short spear or a spear. Yeah, there you go. Mm. Or to fight in close combat using a great spear. Here's a question: Can you do like baton twirling style stuff <laughs> with your spear? I w- with a proficiency, yes. I imagine so. <laughs> Elven color guard, amazing! <laughs> do, 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 do. Look, only if the GM is going to stop you, and if they're going to stop you, it's not a GM I want to play with. So. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't say you. Right. Can if my use one ring those. game doesn't have baton twirling, I'm not showing up. Yeah, I love. That. <laughs> <laughs> I want that on the throw pillow, <laughs> as Tolkien intended. Throw. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So after no, choose, I've seen after Lord of the Rings, our... and bows do not in this game give us close uh, capability for combat, which is a lie because Legolas has been stabbing people with his arrows. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Although, but this is that. proficiency with a bow, not with arrows. Not with arrows. So. Yep. Oh, touche! <laughs> you can't clock people with your bow. <laughs> no poking. That's... No bow poking. Right. You want a broken bow? That's it. You got a broken bow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Call to action. Yeah, like that. I'm I'm really excited that we got to cover this game. I yeah. I fell in love with it when I was reading it for the Ennies. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's been on my shelf because Free League was like, here, have a copy. And I was like, don't mind if I do. <laughs> um and I'm very excited, very, very excited that we got to cover it with with Steph and James, um, who are just fantastic people yeah. i'm gonna keep saying it like uh, honestly they are some of the nicest people i have ever met in my life mm-hmm. um and i know that like 
Jude and Steph are doing very great, very, very exciting things over on Atherbeth. So, it's so good. anybody who wants to know more about this world and if you enjoy the Rings of Power show and you want a little more lore, yeah. please check out their podcast too. Yeah, seriously, um, like that Atherbeth podcast is like, uh, it, there, there's reasons why people have uh, doctorates in Tolkien lore. Because there's, there's so much there. There's so, <laughs> there's so much, much there. there. And yeah. and they do such a good job of diving into that. And it, it's funny because like when they first started that show, Steph was like, I don't know much about Lord of the Rings. And I Jude's know. like, let me tell you. I know, and, I know. <laughs> and here Steph's on the show like, I am I know all about these places and all these places <laughs> and all these things and all this history. And I'm like, good job, Steph. Yes. Have, have the confidence, Steph. We believe in you. No, it's, it, um, it's such a good show, and I, I highly recommend checking it out. And it, um, it falls, again, it's another one of those shows that falls into my favorite category of podcasts, which is Friends Talking About Stuff. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, like, Jude and Steph have been friends for a long time, um, since high school, I think. And so you can you can hear that, too, that they just enjoy hanging out and yep. And having fun and then talking about like really nerdy stuff. And so I I really strongly recommend that show. Um, They do a lot of great stuff over there. Mm -hmm. But it was really it was so much fun to have Steph and James on our show, too, because I've missed them now that we haven't been going to conventions and stuff the last few years. I have missed my friends. I know. It's so good to see them. It is. It well, is. We, so. we could probably gush for hours on how good uh, Steph and James are. Um, we could. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. This call to action is five hours long. Right. Um, this is this but... is now just Steph and, <laughs> Steph and James gushing podcast. Yep. That's not even alliterative. I don't even care. No, it doesn't have to be. They don't even need alliteration. No. They're so great. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, But before we uh, end this episode for today, we do have some calls to action. Um, First up, uh, one of the things that's looking pretty good for us is going to a CADCon this year. Uh, We got finger snaps going on in the the crowd. Um, There is a new booster shot that's coming out uh, hopefully this week. That's going to make me personally feel a lot more comfortable uh, being out in public with people. Uh, The con is like maybe 500 people tops uh it's mm-hmm. probably going to be closer to the three or 400 people yeah um, that's what it's been in the past so, so like uh it, it should be relatively small uh and if, if uh if you want you can come uh chances are we'll be there we both have tickets i still need a hotel room at least um i haven't set that up but i i guess i yeah. should i I should think about that. I haven't really thought much about it because yeah. I've obviously been like doing other stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, had some other, I've had some other things going on. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm really uh, looking forward to going this year. Yeah. I really I I need my friend. I know. Uh, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, on that front, there is only a couple more days left in the Akatakon Kickstarter as of the release of this episode. Uh, So if you want to attend a fairly small convention in the middle of Ohio in November, now is a good chance to hop aboard. It's super low key. Mm -hmm. I like I I try to stress this every year for people. Um, Like if you are one of those people that's looked at Gen Con in the past and been like, oh, no, Mm -hmm. Um, Akatakon might be a con for you. Yeah, it's. It's very low key. It's very chill. It's held in one room. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you there, know, there's a couple auxiliary rooms. Okay, but yes. there are a couple of side <laughs> rooms where they sometimes have panels. Yeah. Um, but the majority of the convention is in one main room, mm-hmm. much like a like like a wedding would be. Like right. it's you know, um, it's not big. It's not loud. It's not you know. So if you're the kind of person like me that suffers from sensory overload really easily, like I, I strongly recommend yeah. a catacon. Yeah, there's, um, there's definitely some good safe spaces to, to kind of sequester yourself off to if things get a little overwhelming. So definitely. Mm-hmm. And there's yeah, there's everybody there is just like super. Everybody's there to like be chill and have a good time. Yeah. Um, unlike, you know, it, it's just not the overwhelming intensity that a lot of conventions are. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And I have it on good authority that there might be a karaoke room there this year. Whoa. <laughs> I did. I did hear rumors. I <laughs> yep. don't do karaoke, but, you know. That's all right. Other people do. That's Spoiler great for alert, them. Uh, I do. So 
Okay. <laughs> and I'm not right. good at it. <laughs> I I don't because my medication messes with my vocal cords. Well, there you go. And my voice cracks really bad. And so I don't. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Uh, aside from a catacon, we don't really have any other non-standard announcements, despite the fact that Ryan and I have not talked much in the last couple of weeks. I know. Um, we uh, we still have our Patreon, so if you like what we do on the show here, there are a few ways that you can support us. Um, the first being with that Patreon, if you have a little money to spare. Um, we are currently about a third of the way to our goal, which would be to fully cover the costs of making the show. Um, so that is the software we use for editing, mm-hmm. our hosting services for our website, all that kind of kind of stuff. Yep. Um, any other subscription things that we need. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so you can head over to patreon.com slash character creation cast to sign up for one of the tiers. Um, and we have we have some good stuff there. We've got a lot of stuff in our bonus archive. Mm. Um, Ryan puts all of our episodes in there as soon as he's done editing them. So if you are one of those people that does not like to wait for episodes, uh, have we got a deal for you? Yeah. Um, but we also have some bonus other stuff in there too um which we've we've been pretty good about it's been pretty decent yeah um and the uh the the early release episodes uh are released without the cold open without the call to action so you get just just the pure episode if if you are a fan of uh just the episode and maybe you skip over this portion of the show uh these are a great way to to know that but yeah i mean you know, the option is there. Uh, even if in the future uh, you want to get into some of the backlog and some of the later series uh, without uh, this portion, uh, if you're wanting to re-listen to things, uh, that's going to be all up on the Patreon too. Definitely. And we are hoping to get more um, bonus stuff in there eventually too, as I start to feel better. Woo. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we do want to thank those of you who have already backed us, though. You're helping to keep the show running and make it possible for us to do even more cool things um, now that we have we have some dollars to do those things. Mm-hmm. So thank you to our first patron, Lieutenant, for your continued support. Mm-hmm. Eric Bonds, thank you as well. David, a.k.a. Tigranosaurus, thank you. Matt Newton, thank you. Daryl Holiday the second, thank you for your support. Shadim Cabal, thank you as well. To the shyest barbarian, thank you so much for all of your support. Benjamin Sweeney, thank you. Lorcan McGinnis, thank you so much. Rob Fletcher, thank you so much. And Kevin Brown, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our future patrons. Uh, We wouldn't be able to make the show as easily without your assistance. And we truly appreciate your generosity. If you would like to support us in another way, um, we are still out of reviews. So Mm -hmm. we would love more reviews. If you're on Android, you can easily leave a review on Podcast Addict. If you're on iOS, you can easily leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're on Windows, your best bet is probably Podchaser because that's a nice web-based one. But also, if you really wanted to download Apple Podcasts on your Windows device, you can certainly do that. You'll just have to update it every 30 minutes. (laughs) 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 We do read all of our um, five-star reviews on the show, and we've been sharing them every week on social media media as part of our five-star Friday, too. Mm -hmm. So you get them shared two places now. Absolutely. Um, And that's all that we have for this week. Uh, We will be back next week to finish up these good, good characters. Oh, I love them. They are so good. Until then, uh, stay safe, everyone. Take care of yourselves. Drink some water. Uh, Maybe maybe breathe uh, in a slow variety so you can get that nice, relaxing feeling going on. Get that good, good air. Absolutely. Uh, and, And keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. 
head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permissions from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero, remixed by Steve Combs, and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used in today's guest can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, extra outtakes, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. gotta read some show blurbs show blurbs show blurbs show blurbs show blurbs character creation cast is hosted by the one shot podcast network if you enjoyed our show visit one shot podcast.com where you will find other great shows like all my fantasy children each week aaron katano sayas and jeff stormer take a listener submitted prompt and using some of their favorite tabletop rpgs create an original fantasy character. Along the way, they share laughs, stories, verbal hugs, and populate a shared universe, one story at a time.